think we're ready to go. And some of us are back, not everyone. First of all, I want to thank Ira for that devotional, um, for putting together those quotations, because what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane, we can't understand. But we know he submitted to his Father's will. And that's what we need to do, too. So that's that's a great lesson for all of us. And that part about Adam, uh, he didn't, um, there were a few things he didn't say anything bad about God, but he didn't obey. And part of our lesson in Micah is going to talk about uh, what well, we're going to review this concept of transgressing and sinning. And the concept of transgressing is disobedience. Pastor brought that out in prayer meeting or a sermon in the past. And that is in the text here also in Micah. But uh, we're, we're gradually getting back to where we were uh, prior to um, this little snag in our broadcast. But I want to welcome everyone to Sabbath School who's with us by phone and in the classroom. Uh, we're just thankful for each one, and I pray that your time with us, all of our time together, will be a blessing to each one. And may um, the thoughts that are presented in Sabbath school lesson and in anything else that's shared, um, may they be holy and sanctified and draw us closer to our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's start with prayer, shall we? Father, we're so thankful for this Sabbath morning here in West Virginia, and we pray that your Spirit will abide with us. We need you so much, Father, to give us discernment and understanding, to point out those things that are important to us as individuals. Each one might have something different the Spirit is speaking to the heart about. So, please, Father, we need your Spirit to teach us, guide us, comfort us, and also give us discernment this morning. Bless each one who has joined us. Be with those who haven't joined, who may not be able to join. Please bless them. Also be with Pastor where he's at in Tennessee. May that gathering be a, um, a special holy gathering on this Sabbath day. Bless each person that's taking part and each participant we ask. And now bless each one here who has taken part and who is part um, a participant. Help us, Father, to draw close to the throne of grace, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you will notice that our verse to remember is Micah 5.2. We read that briefly last week. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been of, from of old, from everlasting. And uh, we thank Ira for uh, sharing a devotional, for Tammy for sharing a health nugget, for Mike Brown in prayer and song service. And now <laughs> we thank God that he will give us his spirit as we move into our lesson. So I'm going to now turn this off here and open our lesson on Micah part two. You need to open your Bible to Micah. And you know, as I've been restudying Micah, the first chapter, the second chapter are important. They have good things that we're going to look at. So let's read together Micah 1. See if we can, um, what we can learn from Micah 1 before we move on to five, chapter 5 and chapter 7. Micah 1 starts off this way. The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morashthite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, 
all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord, from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Now, we think of the high places as mountains, yes, and we know the mountains will dissolve um, just as uh, Jesus is returning the second time. But there are other high places, especially in these early books of the Old Testament, <clears throat> that that. Um, were made into places of worship, of idols. And uh, wh what high places Micah is talking about, I'm not sure. But I do want you to remember that there were these idolatrous high places. And uh, the Bible says, He will come down, the Lord um, will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And then verse 4 also brings in the mountains. The mountains shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Another version says a preface, preposes, preposes. For the transgression of Jacob, is all this. In other words, because of the transgression of Jacob, this is occurring. And for the sins of the house of Israel, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria as an heap of the field. Now, we usually think of that phrase, heap of the field, as um, it's the, uh, the field is in destruction. Whatever was in the field has been destroyed. Um, another version mentions this heap is like a little hut out there in the field. Instead of this city, this city of Samaria, it's going to be wiped uh, down and maybe a hut here or there, whatever, however you want to understand it. But it's going to be destroyed. I will make Samaria, verse 6, and heap of the field, and as plantings of a vineyard instead of a city, bustling city with homes and the palace of the king and marketplaces, it's just going to be wiped and down and destroyed, maybe... Um, a hut here or there, and it's only going to be good for planting a vineyard. And also, I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the fountains thereof. I'm thinking of the walls around Samaria, the protective walls. They were made out of stone. He's, God is promising, I will pour down these stones. I will discover the foundations Verse 7, And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces or torn to pieces, and all the hires of, in other words, wages or things earned from, all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. For she gathered it of the hire of, a, of an harlot, she obtained it, she obtained these idols um, from the wages of being a harlot going on, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore, I will wail and howl. This is God speaking in verse 8. Therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons um, and the morning at as of the owls, and you know, I was thinking of this verse in particular when Ira was sharing about what Jesus went through at Gethsemane and how he poured out um, his heart to his Father, let this cup pass from me. But finally, he said, you know, after asking three times, he submitted to the to the will of the Father. And here the Father is part, is, um, pictured as howling because of the sins and the transgressions of his people. Verse 9, For her wound is incurable, for it is come unto Judah. 
He is come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Declare it not at Gap. Weep ye not at all in the house of Aphrath. Roll yourself in the dust. In other words, it's so bad, don't even talk about it in Gath. Roll yourself in dust. Verse 11, Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Sefer, having thy shame naked. The inhabitant of Zanon come, came not forth in the morning of Bethel zeal. He shall receive of you his standing, for the inhabitant of Maroth waited carefully for good. But evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, do you remember Lachish? Do you remember where it was we studied? Um, north of Samaria, where they built another uh, um, altar to idols. Here it says um, in the Bible, um, in verse 13, O thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Therefore thou shalt give presents to Moresh at at Gath, the houses of Axib shall be a lie to the kings, kings of Israel. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, someone who is going to inherit. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marishath. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. We're going to talk about this verse in a minute. Make thee bald and pull thee. Pull means cut, cut your hair. Pull thee for thy delicate children. In other words, for the loss of your children. Where to, they were to roll in the dust, make themselves bald, cut their hair. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone, these delicate children, into captivity from thee away from thee. Okay, now this verse 15, yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marishath. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Now, do you understand that? As I dwelt upon that, at first it seemed like the glory of Israel is going to come unto Adullam. But what is Adullam? And this glory of Israel can only be God and his son Jesus. And that might seem the um, first and obvious way to understand this, perhaps. First of all, let me tell you about Adullam. Let's go to the next slide. Well, before that, what we've read here in chapter 1 is God talking about how the people have treated him. They've transgressed against him. They've made idols. They've sinned against him. And he mentions Lachish. He mentions um, uh, the delicate children, the loved children that are loved being taken into captivity. He's talking about how his people have treated him. That's Micah 1. And in Micah 1.15, we read about a dulem. Now, you're prob the first thought that comes to your mind is probably the cave of a dulem where David hid. A dulem, uh, as late as the early 4th century, in other words, the early 300s, a dulem was described by Eusebius as being a very large village, about 10 Roman miles east of this particular city. So, even in the early Christian days, there was a, um, what do we call it, a very large village of Adullam going on. And here is a picture. Um, that wooded hill is the hill of Adullam. Here is a picture of some of the walls of Adullam that are still standing. Uh, I shouldn't say some of the walls. It's just a fragment of a wall. And the next picture, now it's slowing down on me, is a trough 
a watering trough. And to get a perspective of how big it is, if you look closely, you'll see a little alarm clock sitting on the wall of that trough. It's a pretty big trough. And that's from a dulum also. Now, let me see if I have any more. Okay. But there is a cave, and I meant to put a picture of um, the entrance to a, a cave in a dulum, but evidently I didn't include it. But there is a cave, and we're going to talk about that cave in a minute. But remember what our text says. Let's read it again. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marisheth. He shall come unto a dulum, the glory of of Israel. Now, uh, another way of looking at understanding this text is the glory of Israel are uh, uh, supposedly the people of Israel. They're, they rep they're representing God, who is the most glorious, of course. And, and so, considering the glory of Israel or even the glory of Jerusalem, you might consider the people, especially the young men and women, in their prime. Um, but they, the Bible is, is saying here in Micah, they will go to Adullam and hide in this cave. That's the context of this destruction that's coming upon um, uh, God's people. Yet I will bring an heir unto this, uh, 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 a recipient of something, an heir. I will bring an heir unto thee. He shall come unto Adullam. He, i.e., the glory of Israel shall come unto Adullam. Now, the next slide I have is Revelation six fourteen through 17. Uh, this is at the end of time. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And I closed my Bible. I need to go back to Micah. Now, this is a sense of what's happening or what is being prophesied here in Micah, that even these great mighty men, uh, um, the glory of Israel, they are going to hide in the cave of Adullam going on. At least that's how it can be understood. I'm just a person like you, and there is no inspired insight about this as far as I know, but if you have something to share, that would be wonderful. Now we're going to move on to My Micah 2. In Micah 2, now the, the scene shifts from what has been done against God the Father, uh, against uh, heaven, shifts now to what has been done to one another. How, how people have treated each other. And I know we read verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, but let's read it again. Woe to them, Micah is saying, that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds when the morning is light, when the day has dawned, i.e. they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Now, I didn't tell you last time that Hebrew word power is E-L, L, and it's often used to represent God. It's this kind of power. It's in their hands. They think they can do it. And they do. They steal, they rob, they kill. But <clears throat> that power is L. And so um, an, another commentator mentioned when people prayed, they lifted up their hands to the Father, to heaven, um, to receive, so to speak, lifting up holy hands. Well, it's like in their hands is this power. Going on, verse 2. 
and they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away so they oppress a man and his house even a man and his heritage <clears throat> therefore thus saith the lord behold against this family do i devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks neither shall ye go haughtily for this time is evil in that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. Um, this is understood by some to be a measuring rod, how they measured, so forth, this casting a cord. Pro verse 6, prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. In other words, a false prophecy. Don't take shame. This isn't going to happen. Don't prophesy this. Verse 7. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them. And I have to read this next verses, but it's horrifying. Pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. These are peaceful people. You attack them. Going on. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses. From their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Ten, arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest, because it is polluted. It shall destroy you, even with the sore destruction. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto them of wine and strong drink, i.e. good times, even he shall even be the prophet of this people. Um, let's see. Um, I want to go on to the uh, chapter 3, who hate the good and love the evil. Here's the part that I hate to read. It's so sorrowful and doleful, as we just read. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. And I'm, I'm going to stop there. But this is what the people, whether that's symbolic or not, I don't know. Maybe you know about flaying the skin and breaking the bones and putting them in the pot. Maybe that's spiritually speaking. I don't know. Do you know? Never. Whatever it is, if it's uh, symbolically speaking, it's a terrible thing because just reading this literally is such a terrible thing. <clears throat> okay, so this is how the people were treating one another. First, how they treated God with their idols, with their rebellion, their transgression, etc. And now how they treat each other with violence. I want to now, before we go on in Micah, step into our culture, our uh, environment today, although this was written in the 1850s, I believe, one testimony starting in 260.2, but the same kind of seriousness. I was shown that the people of God should be closely united in the bonds of Christian fellowship. That wasn't happening in Micah's time. And love. God alone can be our shield and strength in this time of our national calamities. And I, I do want to interject here that this was written just prior to the Civil War. 
but going on. The people of God should awake. Their opportunities to spread the truth should be improved. And that's what we're trying to do with um, organi reorganization going on. For they will not last long, i.e. these opportunities will not last long. I was shown, and here we go, distress and perplexity and famine in the land. Satan is now seeking to hold God's people in a state of inactivity. Now it's true, this is written before the Civil War, but it's, um, it's talking about our state and uh, their state, and it can be applied to us, that Satan is holding us in a state of inactivity, in distress, perplexity, to keep them from acting their part, <clears throat> pardon me, in spreading the truth, that they may at last be weighed in the balance and found wanting going on. God's people must take warning and discern the signs of the times. Think about Micah and what Micah was sharing with the people, trying to warn the people. Today, um, 1855 onward, God's people must take warning and discern the signs of the times. The signs of Christ's coming are too plain to be doubted. And in view of these things, everyone who professes the truth should be a living preacher. God calls upon all, both preachers and people, to awake. All heaven is astir. The scenes of earth's history are fast closing. We are amid the perils of the last days. Was it days or day? Days, yes, going on. Okay, I've lost my place. Here we go. Greater perils are before us, and yet we are not awake. This lack of activity and earnestness in the cause of God is dreadful. This death stupor is from Satan. He controls the minds of unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and leads them to be jealous of one another fault-finding, and censorious. It is his special work to divide heart, his special work to divide hearts that the influence, strength, and labor of God's servants may be kept among unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and their precious time occupied in settling little differences when it should be spent in proclaiming the truth to unbelievers. Now, next page. <clears throat> I was shown, and maybe this is you, maybe this is me. I was shown God's people waiting for some change to take place, a compelling power to take hold of them, i.e., in your mind, <clears throat> it might be the latter rain. Nevertheless, she was shown God's people were waiting for some change to take place, a compelling power. But they will be disappointed, for they are wrong. They must act. They must take hold of the work themselves and earnestly cry to God for a true knowledge of themselves. <clears throat> Pardon me, the scenes which are passing before us are of significant magnitude to cause us to arouse and to urge the truth home to the hearts of all who will listen. <clears throat> the harvest of the earth is nearly ripe. Excuse me. Skipping a page or two in the same testimony, what shall I say? to arouse the remnant people of God. Now, we know Ellen White was a messenger of the Lord. Micah was a messenger to the people then. He spoke in dreadful terms, but he spoke truth. Ellen White is speaking to us in dreadful terms, but is speaking truth. She says, what shall I say to arouse 
the remnant people of God. I was shown that dreadful scenes are before us. Satan is, and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear uh, upon God's people. Now, just want to stop for a minute. You may think, this is all I dwell upon. <laughs> I don't dwell upon the love of God. I do. I try to bring it into everything. I don't dwell upon any peace and safety message. Um, and I'm sorry if it seems like I have a one-track mind, but it ties in to what Micah was saying, and that's why I'm bringing it to you before, bringing it before you now. Um, uh, Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear gun upon God's people, not the world, God's people. He knows that if they sleep a little longer, he is sure of them. For their destruction is certain. Sounds like Michael. Micah, sorry. I warn all who profess the name of Christ to closely examine themselves and make full and thorough confession of their, all their wrongs, that they may go beforehand to judgment, and that the recording angel may write pardon against their names. That's what each one of us wants, pardon. We're guilty. We're worse than Adam. We're worse than Eve in many, many ways. But pardon can be uh, opposite our names if we do the work now while it is yet day going on. My brother, my sister, if these precious moments of mercy are not improved, you will be left without excuse. If you make no special effort to arouse, okay, let's say, um, my words here, let's say, uh, you're, you're happy, and we, we, we are happy. We're a joyful people. That's not the case, but we're um, happy in indolence. We're happy in the, our possessions. We're happy in the things we plan for our lives uh, immediately and far-ranged. Life is good. We have what we need, but we realize Something is speaking to our minds that we haven't aroused ourselves, and we don't know how. And so the only thing you can do is ask God. Ask God to do it for you, and He will. He never has turned a, a sincere person away from what they need ever. So let's just say you're in this condition, um, that you're not aroused, you don't have a zeal, you're not concerned about getting pardon um, across from your name, but you want to be. And the only way is to pray and to pray and to pray and ask God to help you and to read his word. He will speak to you through his word. Okay, going on. Uh, if you make no special effort to arouse, if you will not manifest zeal in repenting, these golden moments will soon pass, and you will be weighed in the balance and found wanting. Then your agonizing cries will be of no avail. Then will apply the words of the Lord, because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when, you, when your fear cometh. And here in Micah, uh, in chapter 3, we just read, let's see. Um, in chapter, uh, verse 4, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. And so my, and Micah says God will not hear them. 
And here Ellen White says, uh, it quotes this um, a passage, because I have called and ye refused, I will laugh at your calamity. Going on. Oh, let me make sure. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come up, cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of or respect of the Lord. They would n none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Beautiful promise. And it's something all of us can partake in, this dwelling safely and being having peace in the face of evil. Going on to the next slide. This looks out of place. Let me just move on. Yes, it should be after this. Now, we're not going to read any more in Micah 3. Micah 4 is a great chapter of promise. I'll just read the first Verse, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it, etc. There, um, we shall every man. Sh verse four: Every man shall sit uh, under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. After these first three chapters of Micah showing the sins of the people and the results that will come of it, there's this promise in the last days, that's our day, that um, uh, it shall come to pass that the house of the Lord shall be established. Um, and now we want to move on to Micah 5.2. Let's just read it. 5.2 states, But thou, be I already read it earlier, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And I know we talked about this last time, um, but I just want to review it because I'm adding something to it. First of all, I, I read this passage from E.J. Wagoner, Christ in His Righteousness, pages 9 through 10. Excuse me, but thou, uh, he quotes that. And then Wagoner says, We know that Christ proceeded forth and came from God, John 8, 42. But it was so far back in the ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. That's E.J. Wagoner. Um, Alan Stump in his book, Foundation of Our Faith, explains that. And I read that last time, but just to give, um, in case you weren't here, and just to review, let's read it again. Wagoner quotes Micah 5.2 and interprets this to mean that Christ was brought Fourth, so far back in the ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. The Hebrew word translated eternity or everlasting, everlasting, eternity is in the margin, everlasting is in the text, is olam. Olam is defined as a vanishing point, generally time out of mind, past or future, i.e. practically eternity. That's from Strong's. This word is used in such places as 1 Samuel 1.22, where we read that Samuel was to appear before the Lord and there abide forever. The phrase forever comes from Olam, and Adventists have been quick to point out that this means only as long as he lived. Another usage of Olam is found in Jonah 2.6, where Jonah describes his experience in the fish. 
I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever, Olam. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. This was only a three-day period. Olam also translated everlasting in Proverbs 8.23. Olam is also translated everlasting in Proverbs 8.23, a text that Sister White applies to Christ. Olam's usages vary and must not violate the weight of evidence from other scriptures. Okay, the, these are two Adventist people speaking about uh, this portion of Micah 5.2. But um, in my research this week for something else, I came across this. And it's a non-Adventist. And this non-Adventist, it relates to this, um, but it's in reference to Matthew 16, 15 through 18, which states, He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Bar Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And, the, and I, excuse me, I left out a word. And I say also unto thee, That Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Again, that's Matthew 16, 15 through 18. And now I want to bring in this quote from Desire of Ages, 412.4. The slide is out of place, that's why I had to back up. Jesus continued, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word Peter signifies a stone, a rolling stone. Peter was not the rock upon which the church was founded. The gates of hell did prevail against him when he denied his Lord with cursing and swearing. The church was built upon one against whom the gates of hell could not pre prevail. Now, I know this is not um, uh, Micah that we're talking about, but, but we're talking about the Son of God. And, and Micah mentions in 5.2 that this ruler, his goings forth, have been from of old, from everlasting. And Peter said, Thou art the Son of the living God. And this is the Son who uh, comes uh, from everlasting, whose goings forth have been from everlasting. So I wanted to share something from a literal translation of the New Testament, a note that the person who translated this, and I should say that he translated it from a manuscript that's in the Vatican Library, and I can't find any other English translations of it. And that's neither here nor there for our lesson, but um, this note is important. He's saying it is impossible that this passage uh, about upon uh, 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 that the church will be built upon Peter is how people understand the passage. He's saying it is impossible that this passage can have a direct relation to St. Peter. Otherwise, the whole, the whole of this uh, passage would be expressed in the masculine gender. It's scarcely, uh, dot, 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 it's scarcely, he gives other reasons, but it's it was too much to try to uh, simplify for our lesson today. But he, he also states, it scarcely admits of doubt. It scarcely admits of doubt that had the sense usually attributed to this passage been the sense intended to have been conveyed, it would have been expressed, and upon thee will I build my church. Now the word rock is a feminine gender, or this pebble that Ellen White uh, mentions. But 
if if it referred to Peter, this rock referred to Peter, um, this translator says it would have to be all be in the masculine gender, and it's not. And also, it would have to be stated differently, such as, upon thee will I build my church. Now, um, maybe that's not significant to you, but I wanted to add it, this little excerpt into what Adventists have said, Ellen White, Wagoner, Stump, have said about um, his goings forth being from everlasting. Here in this section of Matthew, uh, Peter is talking about the Son of the living God. His goings forth, it doesn't say in Matthew, but obviously are from everlasting. You see, it connects. And um, it connects and this gives us a non-Adventist point of view that it cannot be Peter that the church is built upon. It's built upon Christ. And Ellen White mentions upon, upon this truth that Jesus is the Son of the living God. So I wanted to add that. Hope it helps a little bit in your understanding. Now we have time to look at Matthew, Micah, sorry, six eight, which states. Probably can quote it from by heart, but we're going to read it. Micah six eight states, "He hath shewed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly." to love and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. This is what the Lord requires of us. Required of the Israelites uh, at the time of Micah, required of Adam and Eve, even all of his people, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Now this um, concept of doing just it comes from the Hebrew misfat, um, which comes from shafat, which means to judge. To do mispat, that's the Hebrew word translated justly, to do mispat is to order one's life according to the judgments of God. So God requires us to order our life upon his laws and rules and his judgments, not upon man's, especially not upon our own desires. And that, brothers and sisters, is the crux that each one of us faces, whether we'll go this way or that way. Are we going to choose our own ways? God says, I will not hear you when you cry upon me in that day. Are we going to choose God's ways? And the longer you live, I know the longer I live, I realize how foolish my desires, my ways have been and continue to be. Only God's ways are dependable and good and the best for us. No mind could have figured this out. Only God knew. And he gave us just what we need to do justly. God requires us to do justly, which means we order our lives according to his just commandments, his judgments, his judgments not, i.e., of punishment, but judgments of what is right and what is good, and I'm, this is the way it is. You live your life according to that. And that means we walk moment by moment with God, because we can't trust ourselves. <laughs> we can't trust the power in our hands, like, is it Micah 2, 1 states, because we'll do violence to others, because we will covet what they have. This loving mercy um, is the Hebrew word chesed, and it describes a wide range of qualities as indicated by its various translations such as goodness, kindness, loving kindness, merciful kindness, mercy. We are to do justly, we are to love mercy, and we are also to walk humbly. And that word humbly comes from the Hebrew sana, which in the form here 
it is only found once, this form. And it means, besides humbly, a, a suggested meaning in addition to humbly is circumspectly, with caution, carefully. Uh, we think of humbly with humility, uh, knowing that uh, we are nothing and God is everything. Now it's true. Um, I'm standing before you. You talk to your neighbors, your friends, your church members. We, we have something to share, but it, the good part of what we share only comes from Him. We could not have invented it on our own. It comes from our God. To do justly and to love mercy is to act with justice and kindness going on. Now, hmm. let's look at Lamentations 3. I have to put my Bible down to turn these pages. Just a second here. Well, until I get there, we can move to um there we go it's after jeremiah lamentations 3 sorry verse 22 and 23 famous um, verses it is of the lord's mercy mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning Great is thy faithfulness. Didn't we hear that from here this morning? Great is thy faithfulness. Now, let's back up to Psalm 103. Verses 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. And verse 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Let's move now to Hebrews 4.15. Which states, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That should have been 4.15 and 16. And then back up to Ezekiel 34. Exodus, sorry, 34, 6. Five says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and pro proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. So when we read in Micah seven eighteen, and I know I have to hurry on. Let me get to Micah again, seven eighteen about this mercifulness, you can see that it's held in high esteem throughout the Bible. Um, 718, who is God like, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth 
in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Uh, let's see if I can move on. I know it's time to close. I'm going to unlock the slides. I would like you to read this quote from Desire of Ages 480.1. Every soul is fully known to Jesus as if he were the only one whom this, for whom the Savior died. In other words, his compassions are for you, every soul. And then the next slide, Prophets and Kings 325.5. The God whom we serve is long-suffering. We read those. And then I want to close with what I closed last time. In every age, for the sake of those who have remained true, that's you and me, I pray, as well as because of his infinite love for the erring, God has borne long with the rebellious and has urged them to forsake their course of evil and return to him. For the sake of those who remain true, he bears long with the rebellious. Maybe those are your children. Maybe those are your siblings, your parents, your extended family. Because of you, he is speaking to them, urging them to forsake their course of evil. We need to close. May God bless you. If you have any ideas what we should study next, I'm open to suggestions. Just text them into the, um, uh, the box. Or if you're on the phone right now, open your phone. I'm happy to listen to you. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Because we oh, have... Miss. Yes. Hello. Be Sabbath, everyone. Hello. Be Sabbath, Miss Spencer. Yes. Hello, Miss Spencer. Okay, we're going to close with prayer now. So if you're able, would you bow with me? And then kneel with me, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your words given to us through Ellen White for our day also. Father, what more can you do for your people? So please give us discernment. Please give us that zeal and love of your word and love of, of um, truth. Bless each one who's listening. May we walk with you justly and with mercy and with humility. That's our prayer, Lord. Fulfill your good will in our lives, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, may God bless and keep you. I'm going to have to close down so the chapel can take over. Bye for now.